Well, hello, everyone. Um, we are excited. Um, Dr. Miller and I are excited to be able to uh, do this uh, workshop and presentation around training grants. I will share the slides in just a moment. Um, um, and so I'm going to go ahead and share now. And so just in terms of a quick introduction to ourselves, um, my name is Stephen Becker, um, and I'm an associate professor of pediatrics um, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Um, and so I've been actually here for a while. I did a lot of my doctoral training and my practice here at the Center for ADHD at Cincinnati Children's. And then I asked here for internship as a clinical psychologist in training, um, and then joined the faculty after that. And so I've been here for a little while at this point. Um, and then more recently, I've also um, co-direct our fellowship program. And so um, in psychology and pediatric psychology, and so um, can also speak to things from that vantage point if there's questions, if that's useful at all. Um, I'll go ahead and turn this over. Oh, in terms of training grants, I, you'll hear later that I applied for an F31 in graduate school that was certainly not funded. Um, and I lived to tell the tale. Um, so I did an initial submission, a resubmission, neither one was funded. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, and then I was more successful um, once I was hired here and was able to get a K-23 award. So that's kind of my background in terms of training grants. And I'm also somewhat involved in our T-32 um, grants as well here at the institution. Megan? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Megan Miller. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the Mind Institute at UC Davis. Um, and uh, I am involved in our T32 here, our training postdoctoral training grant, which is um, a program that I participated in as a postdoc as well. Um, like Stephen, I submitted an F31 as a graduate student, which was not funded, but um, I did the thing you're not supposed to do, which is I didn't even try to resubmit, um, and you should always try. Um, and then uh, as a postdoc, I applied for a K99 R00 and got that, and I'm just wrapping up the R00 phase of that grant now. So in terms of a general overview of what we're kind of trying to do this afternoon or this morning or night, wherever you may be living, is why a training grant in the first place? What are we even, why are we even talking about them? Um, what are the different types of training grants that might be out there? And then if, uh, given the time limitations, we're gonna do broad introduction to kind of what the training grants look like, um, especially the F31, F32s, as well as the K awards. Um, and then turning it to really not only kind of the why training grant and what are the opportunities for training grants out there, but also then how do you go about actually doing one? Uh, how do you tell your story? How do you pick a topic? What does, what are the training components even mean? Um, and then also give some information about what happens once you hit, or your grants office hits that button and submits the grant um, in terms of the grant review process and the feedback that you'll get back. Um, and then we'll touch base briefly about institution grants T32s and uh, Hopefully have a lot of time for all of your questions and some nice discussion. So in terms of why applying for a training grant, um, I think it's really important as you think about a training grant, to of course, the goal is that you're gonna get the grant, you're gonna get it on the first su submission, it's gonna be beautifully scored, they're gonna all love it. The reality is that might not happen. I hope it does happen for you, but it might not. And so I do think an extremely important part about going into a training grant um, is really thinking through how much it means just in terms of your broader professional development, even if you don't get the grant. And so I think Megan would probably agree that even though we didn't get our F31s, it, it was still a tremendously valuable experience. I know for me personally, it was my first experience ever learning really anything about NIH and the systems and all the documents and how does even a grant get uh, uh, written and all the different pieces and submitted and the review process. And so my grant did not get funded, but I feel like it gave me a really terrific exposure to um, what the grant writing process looks like and if it's something I wanted to even do ever again in my life, um, as well as kind of exposure to uh, funding agencies that are out there. Um, if you, once you, I'm gonna say once you do get your training grant, I think the, the key piece is the goal really is then for, the, for them to give you opportunities to advance your training in a way that's really beyond what you're able to probably do in your program. And that's really something that reviewers will be looking for pretty directly in terms of is this training grant really going to give this applicant something that moves them beyond what they would typically get in their program already? So access to certain methods or certain investigators or certain labs or certain data sets, whatever the case may be. 
And so with that, you get a lot of additional mentoring. You would have a, a sponsor or a mentor, a co-sponsor and a mentoring team often. And so it really is very useful for expanding your professional network. Um, and I do think that this really can happen even again, if you don't get your training award. So when my F31 was not funded, I still reached out to one of the persons who was a consultant on my F31 and said, hey, that idea that we said we were gonna do in the grant about doing this paper, I know we didn't get the grant, I'm not gonna be able to come probably visit your lab, but I would love to still work on that paper. Um, and we did do that and it, it was a great, um, and we still collaborate together today. Um, so it's a nice way to kind of forge um, some initial uh, collaborations and expand your network in that way. And of course, one of the most lovely things about training grants is that they really are designed to protect you, your time to execute research and oversee research projects. And so with all of that, certainly training grants uh, advance your career. They're looked upon, upon very favorably by, by internship programs, by postdoctoral programs, by faculty program, uh, positions, all of those things as you move up the ladder. So these are uh, the primary NIH training grants that are out there. I do also want to make sure to mention that for a lot of these training grants, there are also there's the kind of what we call the parent grant, um, which is kind of the overarching grant that a lot of uh, NIH institutes will use. But there, for many of them, there's also a diversity specific one. Um, we certainly have, there's a tremendous need for there to be people that don't look like me as a white male in uh, doing science, um, and so there are definitely training grants out there um, that are specific to building a workforce with building a more diverse workforce. Um, so the F30 um, is uh, specific to PhD MD programs. Um, so that's one's pretty, uh, a little more narrow and not one that I've actually encountered very much myself personally. The F31 is uh, the one that we mentioned, Megan and I applied for while we were in graduate school. Um, so this is really a pre-doctoral training grant. So as you're working on thinking about your dissertation or those sorts of things, this is often when people working on F31 applications to try to, try to get funding at the pre-doctoral level. I will say that one of the things about the F31 that's a little tricky, I think, and Megan mentioned that she did not resubmit hers. I don't know if this was her reason, but often the timeline just gets to be a little tricky because you wanna keep going to graduate and go on to internship if you're a clinical, being clinically trained. Um, and so sometimes the timeline, the earlier you can start thinking about uh, a grant in this, in this fashion, the more chances that you have to resubmit before kind of the timeline runs out. Um, the F32 is uh, an individual grant specific to postdoctoral training. So kind of building your own fellowship, what would that look like and having funding uh, to do so. Um, the K01 or the K21 or I K23, there's a lot of different K numbers out there. These are early career awards. So these are really when you are just starting off into a faculty position at either a medical center or a university environment. Um, they protect a lot of your time for, for research. Um, and then like Megan mentioned, the K99 R00 um, is a really unique mechanism in terms of there's the training component and then there's moving on to the independent phase that Megan will talk about a little bit um, as well later. We did also want to mention that there are a number of other training grants. So NIH is by far the largest funder um, for research in the United States, um, but there are certainly other um, federal and also non-federal agencies. And so both of the first two listed here, NSF and IES, are federal agencies. Um, the Science Foundation and the Institute of Education Sciences is the research arm of the U.S. Department of Education. So they also have both pre and postdoctoral training programs for those whose research is relevant to education science. Um, and they think about that broadly. Um, so I've had some, and I, I'm not a training grant, but I've had NIES projects um, that are really focused on ADHD, social emotional learning, behavioral um, interventions, those sorts of things. So there's a lot that's focused on specific education around literacy or mathematics, but it's also very much broad in terms of really anything that impacts children. And then there's just, these are some of the foundations that we, are, we know of. Um, there are many, many others that are out there um, that are specific either to a population or a disorder or just more general um, in terms of uh, different training foundation grants. One thing that I, uh, we're gonna go through now kind of some of the different pieces and talk about what those look like for training grants. I thought that it might be useful just to mention we don't, for each slide or each piece, mention what the page limits are, but you're going to, if you're working on training grant, want to know exactly what your page limits can be. You can find that using this link. Very easy to just do a Google search and type in NIH uh, 
F award page limits, and this table comes up um, just to give you an idea of this isn't actually all of the different components that go into an F award. Uh, this screenshot, I didn't, wasn't able to get it all in one, um, but these are some of the main components, and you can see there's very specific guidelines in terms of page limits, um, or even certainly for the project summary abstract, it needs to be no more than 30 lines of text. So in terms of the breakdown of the F30, 31, and 32 awards, um, on this first slide, these are really the pieces that are going to require probably the most work. They're also probably the most important because these are each going to be evaluated by reviewers very specifically. Um, one thing that's really important to think about for training grants is that the science, of course, really matters. But so does, it's really equally weighted with the science and the project that's being proposed and how it's going to advance the field, but also the applicant. It's really focused on, is this an applicant that we think is going to really kind of shift paradigms and shift the field and be a, go on to be a productive scientist. The goals of these training awards really are not that you got one training award and then you're done. The goal is really to set you up for getting the next grant and the K23 to get your R01 or an R level grant and things like that. And so uh, one thing to just be very mindful of is making sure that the applicant background and what your goals are for fellowship training is just as strong and they put just as much thought and as much effort into that as you do in terms of the methodology and the science that you're proposing as well. Um, and the, to show that they're equally weighted, both the applicant background section as well as the research strategy section are both, both six pages in length for these um, So you really do want to make sure that you um, hit that pretty hard. Specific aims uh, is going to be one page um, across grants. Um, and this is really where you, this is probably the, often the very first thing that a lot of reviewers are going to look at. Does that one page summary that summarizes what is the research question? Why is it a problem? Why is it important to solve it? How are you going to carve out a piece of that? Um, and what are your aims and hypotheses? That's on one page. Um, but really the goal is, does that excite, can you excite the reader and the, and the reviewer to want to actually be like, wow, this is actually really terrific. This sounds like a fantastic study. I really want to go and read those other six pages to learn more about what the, the applicant's proposing to do. And then the research strategy focuses on um, a few main pieces. So the significance of the problem um, that's out there that you've identified. Uh, it's always great if you are able to include preliminary data that can be modest, um, depending on if there's some in the lab you've been working on, or if you've pilot tested kind of some procedures that you're proposing to do. Um, really, especially for these early training grant awards, applicants also wanna make sure you know that the, what you're proposing to do is feasible that you can actually pull it off, that you, can, that you can reach your target sample size, that you've got a way to recruit these, the, your participants, um, whatever the case may be. And all of those things can go into preliminary data. So even if you have preliminary data for a hypothesis in terms of that you might have, that's fantastic, definitely include that. But some of the things that I included in my F31 MIK award around preliminary data also included things like, how many patients do we see here in the center? How many would meet the inclusion criteria and the age range in any given year? to document that feasibility around, around the approach. And then the approach itself is really your methods um, in terms of um, what are your measures you're going to use, what are the procedures, what do the visits look like, a brief description of inclusion exclusion criteria, um, as well as your statistical analysis um, plan. Then respective contributions is a uh, unique part of the F in that it really is a place for you to talk. Um, I believe this is one page uh, where you can talk about how you kind of really came about forming the application with your co-mentor or your co-sponsors, um, and really what was your role in thinking about the research question? How did you engage um, um, with your co-mentors around that? For example, I was a co-mentor on an application that went in, also not funded, um, where, but we talked about how we'd already established kind of some working collaborations, had a couple papers under review with the applicant who was not at my institution, those sorts of things. There are many other pieces that you will also be able to work on as you can work on your F award application. So you're definitely going to have um, an opportunity to talk about the amazing mentoring team that you've established, um, both in text, but then also all uh, mentors as well as you as the applicant will include a bio sketch. So bio sketch is a five page document that really summarizes an individuals. You can easily find a format and example by Googling it on um, NH's website. Um, where it talks about not only the education and honors and publications and contributions to science, but there's also a part at the beginning where you talk about what you'll be doing for that project. 
that's a really important piece for you as the applicant to have a narrative um, for, the app, for the reviewers about what your role is, where you're going, where you see this project taking you, as well as really for your mentors and co-sponsors uh, to also talk about their commitment to mentorship, their history and track record of mentorship and training, as well as the feasibility um, of your project and those sorts of things. And then you will very likely also have consultants who are included on your F award um, and letters. They can include letters that they submit directly to NIH. You don't need to have bio sketches for each of them. You'll also have pieces where you talk about how you selected the sponsor, um, why that person is the best person um, for this. Um, you can have one sponsor, you can have a co-sponsor. Um, I will say that often people do like to see a track record reviewers um, in terms of collaboration. Um, and I have seen comments in terms of if one of your co-sponsors is remote and at a different institution, being able to document that you've had some sort of collaboration or that you've had calls in advance of preparing the application or those sorts of things to make sure that it really is a feasible relationship where both people are invested. Although maybe now, since nobody meets in person any right now, maybe that's less of an issue because uh, you can just talk about how you've done Zoom calls with everybody. Um, you will, of course, with any training mechanism, have um, uh, training in responsible conduct of research and human subjects research, if that's applicable in terms of ethics um, and different tra ongoing trainings there. Your sponsor and co-sponsor will have statements that go into the, into the award itself, talking about how you are an amazing applicant, how you are, are really, a, prepared for this project and to shift the field. Um, often the applicant, I think, helps draft that uh, along with the sponsor and co-sponsors. And I think I already mentioned letters of support as well. And then institutional uh, letter that really shows the commitment of the broader institution to you as an applicant and to your, to your award, should it be funded. These are some of the smaller pieces, um, the research summary and abstract that will get posted if the award is funded on NIH's website. And that can be no more than 30 lines of text. So really a general overview of the project. Um, a project narrative is I think maybe one or two sentences where it really is what is in, in a super short space, what is the public health significance of your project? And then bibliography, uh, facilities and other resources. Do you, have the, do you have the things that you need at your institution to be able to execute your proposed study? And then do you have access to the equipment or will you be able to have access to any equipment that you need? So that could be scanner time, or for me, it was actigraph watches to look at sleep measurement, things like that. Protection of human subjects, that is anything that you need to go into detail about around ethical issues. So this is really a lot of things about inclusion, exclusion criteria, sampling and recruitment. How are you going, are you going to do a phone screen? Are you doing study visits? really all the ethical pieces that would go into kind of an IRB protocol, including things like safety uh, data, safety monitoring plan, if applicable, as well as including of women and minorities um, and inclusion of children, if that's applicable. All of these things are things that reviewers are gonna be looking for. Um, these are things that can be short pieces. Um, so if I'm looking at children with ADHD, I might simply say this project focuses on children with ADHD, so all participants will be children because of that. Um, it's not always quite so simple, but that's kind of the general idea. You also include kind of an overview of what your uh, sample size is going to look like, as well as sample size across um, sex, race, and ethnic, ethnic distributions. I, that's a lot about the F awards, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Megan momentarily, but maybe we can just pause for just a second to see if there's any specific questions, or I don't know, maybe there's been some in the chat, I don't know. Um, around F awards specifically. If you are muted and you do want to ask a question, please feel free to do so. Anything, Megan, that you would add about F awards before you jump into K? No, I was thinking the same to pause to see if there are any questions, but also to just note that um, we'll talk about the review process. So, you know, if there are questions about that, maybe we'll save those until after that component. But if people have questions about the nuts and bolts, um, uh, before we jump into case, please do ask them. I know it can take a second to type something into the chat. So maybe we'll just give a few more seconds to see if there are any questions. I'm pulling up the chat now and I don't see any so far. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you have any suggestions for current graduate students planning to apply for F32 
So if you haven't started your postdoc, what's the best way to format your application so that you can still show that you're qualified and you have a connection with that PI? That's a really good question. And so in terms of like, like so I just want to make sure I'm understanding it completely. So the, how do you document kind of an established relationship yes. with someone that you're thinking for an F32, even if that relationship hasn't, you haven't really trained under that person previously. Is that fair? Yes. So I think um, some things that worked really well for me um, were to do early things at conferences in terms of networking when conferences used to also happen. Um, and so for me personally, I know when I was working on my F31, I had an idea of, and again, it was not funded. I'll keep saying that as many possible ways, times as I can. Um, but I, I organized a symposium when I was in graduate school and I specifically chose people that I thought would either be great in terms of collaborators in just in general, but also people who I thought might be able to be kind of consultants or co-sponsor on an application. And so I think anything that you can do towards those sorts of things, um, if you are already talking with this individual, I think you could say like, hey, I'd love to write an F. I'd love to think of brainstorm ways that we can build a document in our FF, my FF application that we have an established working relationship. So I'd love to have a set up a call to even just talk about like, if there might be a paper we could work on together or there's data that I could be involved with um, or come visit your lab if that's a feasible thing to do or things of that nature. Yeah, and the only other things that I would add are, um, you know, like Stephen's saying, if you have the relationship with that person already and they're sort of already committed to sponsoring your application um, while you're still in graduate school, um, especially if you came to the realization that this would be a good fit later in your grad school career, uh, I don't, I don't know for sure that it's necessary to have, you know, published papers with that individual at this point, but if they are able to talk about in their um, letter or their sponsor letter, this is a paper we're working on and here's my, this is what my experience has been like working with this person so far, or just a paper we're planning or planning the project, things like that, just so that they can, um, their letter will probably be really important in that case uh, if, if this would be a new relationship and you're still in graduate school and haven't gone there yet. But I kind of think about it as I have seen the same sort of process for people before graduate school who apply for NSFs before, um, before starting grad school. Um, and sometimes people form the relationship with the proposed mentor um, before they've even applied to grad school and apply for an NSF. Um, and I've seen that work out. So, I mean, I think it's kind of the same idea, just the, a, a slightly later stage in the process. Um, I haven't encountered it before, but I, I can imagine that the, kind of their, the sponsor's letter would be particularly important in that case. And I also think the more specifics you can give, I think will help uh, um, satisfy reviewers around, okay, they're not just giving kind of lip service, like, oh yeah, I'm excited to work with this person, but saying like, we've had one hour weekly Zoom calls for the last three months as we've been preparing this application, shows kind of that level of investment commitment um, that's already being built. Thank you. Okay, well maybe we'll, we'll shift gears, but, um, <clears throat> We'll take another break before the next section to see if there are other questions. Um, does that sound okay to you, Stephen? Sounds okay. great. Great, all right. So um, now we're gonna shift into talking about the same kind of thing, same structure, but talking about the K. So shifting from Fs to Ks. Um, and I'm gonna try to mostly spend time describing things that are um, more specific to the K. So there's some stuff that overlaps with the F um, to some degree, um, and then some stuff that is a little bit new when you're applying for a K. So the candidate information component is, um, you know, this is information that you have to provide in the F application as well, but I think becomes especially important with the K. Um, I think something that can happen when people are applying for Ks in particular is getting um, very focused on just the research plan and the research plan is really important but the training plan and the candidate is equally important so I always tell people to spend half their effort on these components as well in fact some reviewers consider them to be even more important than the research plan so this isn't a section that you can just sort of whip out you really have to make the case for kind of why your background sets you up best for, for this particular training plan and project what 
what, um, what, what about your history kind of uh, leads you to this point? What are your goals and your objectives? Um, and then you also will have to talk about um, kind of your training plan. So uh, this could be coursework or different professional development activities, um, but you're gonna need to be extremely specific about this. So ultimately the, the candidate information pieces are really, what do you need in order to, to emerge on the other side of this K as someone who's really independent and ready to, you know, set up their own lab or, or take their own lab in new directions to get an R grant. And so kind of depends which K version you're, you're doing, what the ultimate goal is, but um, generally independence and um, R grants. All right. Um, like the F and like any NIH grant, you're going to have a one page specific aims page. Um, Stephen talked about what that looks like. Um, you're going to have um, a research strategy which includes those same components, significance, innovation, your approach. Um, you know, nothing really changes here. I think the biggest thing that can be a challenge with the K's is that all of that candidate information stuff um, and the research strategy have to be 12 no longer than 12 pages combined, but they're separate documents. So you've got your candidate information document, your training plan document, and your um, research strategy doc document um, as separate pages. You need to put them all together at some point to be really sure that they're not longer than 12 pages when they're put together. I have heard horror stories of people's applications being um, not accepted because they were a line over 12 pages across those three um, documents. Um, so that's just something kind of practical to keep in mind. Um, we can look at the next slide. So this is the same kind of thing that Stephen pulled out for the Fs. He had a screenshot, but it, um, the page limits are generally the same. Um, you can find this information very easily on the NIH website, but it kind of goes through the components that you will um, you will be focused on. So you've got your abstract, which is that 30 line thing that Stephen mentioned. The project narrative is a few couple to a few sentences, and that's the piece. Um, that'll be made publicly available as well. Um, the other pieces that I would um, point out here, uh, one thing that I did for my K99, and maybe Stephen um, can say how he approached this, but you've got your um, plans and statements from your mentor and co-mentors for the K, um, but you, you again may also have letters of support from collaborators or other people involved in your training. So um, as part of my training plan, I had my two mentors, both of whom were on site, although that's not required. But then I also put together what I called, I don't know, I think I called it something like a, a advisory committee or something like that. So it wasn't technically an, uh, another group of mentors and actually most of them weren't really considered collaborators. They were more like consultants. Um, but anyway, these are people who you might want to uh, you know, they might fill a gap in your knowledge um, or training area that isn't filled by either of your mentors, so they can consult on certain things. For me, what I was doing was um, building on my prior uh, work in ADHD and in autism and trying to put those things together. So, um, you know, my mentors on site knew a lot about older kids with ADHD, babies developing autism, I needed someone who could help fill that gap of really little kids with ADHD or at risk for ADHD. And so I found someone um, who could consult on those things and described how that would work, described a lab visit as part of my training plan to their site to get exposure to their knowledge, described exactly how many times and how frequently we would be communicating in that training plan and so on. So um, those are, they can be very brief letters, but they're very helpful to to show that you're not just saying you'll do these things, that you really have commitment from these outside people um, who, who are going to agree to communicate with you and consult with you over the course, course of your award. Um, so, uh, and, and then the other thing that I think is distinct from the Fs with most of the Ks, the K99 excluded, is that institutional commitment. So, um, you know, with an F, it's more like they're in our graduate program and we have all of these resources within our program and our department. 
Um, with the Ks, really, they're going, with the exception of the K99, they really need to be providing a commitment for a, a position, like a faculty position in their department, um, or, and um, resources like space and um, things that are a little bit like lab space and things like that. So it's, it is slightly different than the F um, and different departments handle that differently. So like historically in my department, although this has changed, um, previous chairs have not really been supportive of K awards. And so that has been a real challenge for people. Whereas in other departments, they're super common. So if you're interested in a K, it's really important to start that conversation with your departmental leadership as well early on to be sure that if you were to get it, they'd really have a home for you there as well. All right, next slide. So I mentioned how um, the K99 is different and kind of strange, and I just wanted to say a few things about it because um, I do get a lot of questions about it uh, as somebody who did have one. Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of interest from, from postdocs, at least at my institution and, and others, in this particular mechanism. So. This is kind of this mechanism that's a little bit in between your postdoc and um, an independent faculty position where you have a year or two, usually two, um, that's still mentored training. Um, so you've probably been doing a postdoc. It's really meant for senior postdocs. Um, you've been in a postdoc for a year or two already um, and you're interested in staying longer but maybe want to learn something new. Um, and so it's meant to give you that mentored training in, in that new area, just like all of the Ks are. Um, but with the um, plan that after that, you know, in the last year of that K99 phase, you'll apply for faculty jobs and you won't get the second phase, which is the R00 phase, the independent phase of funds until you are in an independent faculty position. So that second three years is really contingent upon um, obtaining a faculty position. Now the idea is that having this kind of award can make it more likely that you'll be able to secure such a position because you'll be bringing some money along with you to jumpstart your research and so on. Um, and I think in general that that has panned out for the most part for, for this mechanism NIH wide. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the historically uh, it had been kind of a rule that people were not allowed to stay at the same institution where they did the K99 portion for the R00. Um, but when I was transitioning, um, and I'm at the same institution still now in the R00, uh, my program officer mentioned that they kind of looked at the data and now it's more like half of people end up staying where they were in their postdocs. Um, I'm not sure what the reasons are for that. It might be that, um, you know, faculty positions can be kind of hard to come by and they're starting to recognize that. If you have a good position, why would they prevent you from um, continuing on with this award? Um, but all this is to say that there is a lot of consultation that will go on with your program officer at NIH when you're considering um, different faculty positions. So I had the experience of kind of bringing the different offers that I received to my program officer for review and getting feedback and then kind of having to use that feedback in a way to, to let the department know this is what they said um, would be needed in order for them to feel comfortable releasing that R00 money to me. So uh, if you're uncomfortable with negotiating, like many of us are, it can be very helpful to be able to kind of put that on the program officer. Um, but I, you know, you hear stories too of where um, NIH wasn't satisfied with any of the offers and people have decided to take an offer without, um, without being able to, to get the next phase of the award. So, you know, it's, it's um, a little bit of a mixed bag, I think, but by and large, for the most part, um, people kind of are able to, to use this award to help get a faculty position and then get a jump start in the independent phase of their career. Um, so um, this, uh, picking your topic, telling your story is of course like the most important part of an F or a K. Um, you, 
you need, even though we're talking about, you know, you want to learn something new, you want to kind of maybe expand your focus or get a new skill, it still needs to make a lot of sense. So it can't be completely disparate. Um, you still have to make the case for how what you're proposing really builds on what you've done in graduate school um, to extend to a new um, area or develop a new skill. So like I said, um, for me, I the kind of areas that I thought I wanted and needed to expand into were more solidly into infancy and early childhood, um, particularly with respect to ADHD and understanding kind of similarities and differences across autism and ADHD. So all the pieces were kind of there separately and I wanted to find a way to put them together. Um, for me, that looked like recruiting a cohort of infants at familial risk for ADHD in the context of my mentor's study of infants at familial risk for autism. So it was recruiting a new cohort um, so that I could learn these things and, and do this research. Um, that felt for me like the, the piece that was missing from the picture of where I wanted to go over the next five to ten years. Um, and so you know making the case in these training plans for the, the new methods that you'll need to learn. Is it eye tracking? Is it neuroimaging? Um, is it some new statistical method um, where you're either going to kind of do mentored training in that or maybe even take or audit a course on that topic? Um, is, you know, are you wanting to start to learn how to do clinical trials and you're gonna need to um, get some additional training in that area? All of those kinds of things are what you would want to describe um, in your story of your training plan. And you're going to want to choose your topic, of course, based on what's interesting to you, what fits kind of with your experience and background and makes kind of sense as a next step. But also, you know, what are some questions that are unresolved in your field? Um, you don't want to just be doing something that someone else has already done. You really need to still be kind of trying to push the needle and, and the field forward, um, considering all of these things as well. So the goal is to pick topic a topic that is relevant for you, makes sense for you, is kind of direction you want to go because of your interests, but also that is going to be um, relevant to the field because remember, it's going to be reviewed by people um, in the field. So speaking of that review process, um, Across all of the areas that get rated, reviewers use a scale from one to nine. So one is the best score and nine is, is the worst score. So each of five areas get rated on that scale and we'll talk about what they are because they're slightly different between the F and the K. Um, and then each reviewer also gives an overall impact score, which is sort of like the summary score um, for your application. And it's not, um, it's funny because of all of these rubrics and guidelines, you would think that it would be sort of formulaic, but it's that overall score is not. It's um, really um, derived by the reviewer from their whole holistic review and, and the scores that they've given, um, but not in a mathematical formula. So the reviewers are told to weigh the different criteria, those five different areas, how they see fit in, in generating the overall score. Um, your application, and this is true for fellowships, but also for other um, like R, R01s, R21s, will have, be assigned to three different reviewers, um, two of whom will provide uh, um, an extensive scoring and um, comments, and one who will provide some scores and brief comments. So you'll have a primary viewer, a secondary viewer, and then a third reviewer as well. Um, they'll all rate it. And then what happens is um, half of the applications in a given study section, a review, review panel, will we'll get what's called triaged or not discussed. Um, so only the top 50% of applications will actually be brought to the larger group, the larger review committee for discussion. Um, so what happens there is that you know, your primary reviewer will give an overview of your application, their impressions, the strengths and weaknesses. Um, you as an applicant for these training grants, that will be very important. Um, and then after some discussion, there, each person on the committee will provide an overall impact score, which gets averaged into a summary score. And that is how you get your score. There's actually a really um, kind of outdated in terms of like quality of the video, but, uh, and it's not in our field, the example, but um, NIH, if you Google, it does have a video of a mock review session, um, I think from the biological sciences, um, 
the process has not changed since it was filmed as far as I know. So uh, you, if you're interested, you may Google that to just kind of get a better sense of what it looks like um, in real life. So um, this is where I was saying that the, the individual criteria is vary just slightly between F awards and K awards. So both have the overall impact score. Um, there's a candidate score for both the F and the K for whatever reason, they call them something different. Um, there are um, scores for your sponsors or mentors, collaborators, consultants, again, slightly different names, but kind of the same thing. Um, and then for the F there is, a score for um, the research training plan and a separate score for the, the candidate's training potential. Um, whereas for the Ks, it's kind of all um, focused on the career development plan and your goals. Um, and then finally, the institutional environment. Um, uh, again, called something slightly different, but uh, means ultimately the same thing. And with the K, there's a, a score for the research plan. So moving into the next um, few slides, I'm going to talk about specifically the F awards, but you can see from that last uh, visual just how the, the different components map on to each other. Um, and I think probably this morning the, the research plan section was discussed in, in one of the earlier sessions in greater detail, so um, we're not going to talk much about that. Um, so we'll talk about each of the areas now that are reviewed for F awards. So um, the first is the fellowship applicant, and again, on a one to nine scale, and these are the kinds of things that the reviewers will be considering. Um, so how many publications? Of course, they are meant to keep in mind where you're at in your training when they're considering these things, and some reviewers are better than others at that. Um, they're especially interested in seeing um, if you have first authored publications. In general, they weigh um, peer-reviewed publications um, more heavily than um, chapters, for example. Um, they're gonna be looking at letters of recommendation, what your prior training is, um, including um, probably kind of like what program you're, you're in and where you're coming from, um, any awards and honors, grades and GREs, and, and that's the part that Stephen and I have the stories about. I, for, um, I think both of us got comments about our GRE scores, which seems like a funny thing. Um, we, as we were preparing this, both had the experience pulling up our um, summary statements from our F31 submissions just to remind ourselves of the process. Um, and, you know, I'll let Stephen comment about kind of what his experience was uh, in that review process. For me, what was funny is, is I told Stephen that um, mine wasn't discussed and then I pulled it up and I realized, oh no, it actually was discussed. That my memory though was that it wasn't because it was that bad. Um, and my score may as well have not been discussed. So the score was a 58, which is the 72nd percentile. So a 10 is a perfect score. Um, not very great. Um, and the kinds of comments that, that, that I got for that particular application um, were pretty vague. I think it was just so bad that they couldn't even be that specific. You know, there are a number of concerns with the proposed research, um, the proposal is not well focused, the verbal GRE is, is reasonable but not outstanding. Those are the kinds of things that, that were the downfall, I guess, of my application. I don't know if you want to say anything, Stephen, about your it experience. Was, it was kind of surreal looking, digging those back up. I do have some of my favorites here. Um, so, the majority expressed concerns about the ap applicant's apparent lack of focus and weaknesses in the research proposal. Ouch. Even if the hypothesis were supported, it is not clear that this would generate new and clinically useful findings. And then my personal favorite, also about the GRE, is his verbal GRE is surprisingly low given his prolific writing. It's a kind of a, a underhanded thing. Yeah. Um, and I, we laugh now, Megan and I, um, but I will add that when I got those reviews, it was crushing. Um, yeah. It was really, really hard to take in. Um, you put so much work into these things. Um, you have high hopes of not getting comments like that. Um, and so I think it is a good example of, you know, dealing with the feedback as you get it, taking a break from it, um, talking with your mentors and other supports that you have in your life, and then thinking about if you want to write another grant in the future. And both of us did, um, and we're successful in doing so. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing that this reminded me is, is to remember those experiences. Um, clearly, I had changed my memory of what actually happened over time, um, but it's, it's uh, 
important, I think, for, for, for all of us as we go forward in our careers, uh, whatever stage we're at now, to, to remember what that was like and to maybe not um, present things that way when we are the reviewers in the future, um, because there are probably a lot more constructive ways that we could have gotten the feedback we got. Okay, good. Next slide, if you don't mind, Stephen. Thank sure. you. Um, so um, the other <clears throat> topic that will be scored is sponsors, collaborators, and consultants. Um, the kinds of things reviewers will be looking for among your these people on your application, so your mentors and, and consultants, is what's their record of funding, what's their publication record. Um, does the selection of that particular collaborator or mentor fit with your training goals, and does this relationship make sense? Um, as Stephen was talking about earlier, um, you know, you want to be able to convey and demonstrate um, both in kind of your descriptions of your activities, but also, you know, on a bio sketch if possible through shared publications and things like that. But you, the reviewers are going to be looking to see, um, is there a previous relationship here among the sponsorship team in addition to with, with you and these team members? So um, are these... Um, you know, faculty members who have worked together before, or are they complete strangers? Uh, ultimately, what they're trying to get at, again, is this feasibility, like what's the, the likelihood that this training experience will be successful for this applicant? Um, so this will be kind of figured out through the letters that get written, but also the bio sketches. Um, they're going to want to know that the, the primary sponsor has the funding available to cover the research that you're proposing. So Largely what these grants um, fund uh, is you, your, your stipend or salary, not as much funding to actually do the research project. Um, and then they're going to want to see that there's a commitment um, to give you the time um, that you're going to have the availability um, to do the project, but also that your um, sponsors and collaborators and consultants are really going to have the ability and time available to provide you with mentorship and training over the course of your um, uh, award. Um, and I mentioned the history of mentoring. Um, oh, history of mentoring, sorry. Um, history of mentoring people who have gotten F4K awards. And I think also, especially if you're applying for a K, um, reviewers want to see a history of your proposed mentors, um, uh, like track record of prior trainees. So not just did they have trainees who got F and K awards, but um, where are those people now? Are they in faculty positions or, or not? Um, that's something that they'll want to take a look at. And I would just add on to that, since the goal of the K is to lead to our level funding, did the, F, did the mentors previous K trainees, did they actually go on to reach that NIH goal? Yeah, great. Um, and then the, the research um, components, they're going to want to look, um, they're going to look at kind of the key components, the, the things that you're, you're meant to have, the background and significance, innovation, your aims and hypotheses, whether you have pilot data that is supportive of these um, preliminary hypotheses, and as Stephen said, that suggests feasibility. Um, you know, I think the, the sad truth um, is that even when it says that pilot data is not required for different types of grants, it, something is really um, unfortunately um, even if NIH says it reviewers will have their preconceived notions and as much as they're told by you know the the people running the meeting that they shouldn't be considering certain things sometimes it's really hard for for a reviewer to shift their thinking so some sort of data to kind of indicate feasibility and and supporting um, you know why you're hypothesizing what you're hypothesizing um, you know when you're getting to our um, awards this this component is really, really important. It's the biggest piece, I think. But um, for the F and K awards, really that balance between the candidate, the training plan, and the research project is there. So um, this is very important, but just equally important is all of the, the candidate information pieces that we talked about. Um, and then training potential will be scored. So. Um, like I said, this is the most important section, and, and in general, viewers kind of weigh this heavily in their overall score. Although it's an algorithm, this plays into how they score applications kind of on the global level pretty strongly. So this is where um, they're thinking about, you know, is this training plan feasible? Um, are you actually really going to be able to meet with all of your um, collaborators and 
consultants and mentors on a regular basis or are you just going to be in too many meetings to do that? Is, is there really a plan that's well thought out about kind of how those members will communicate together? Um, how frequently will you be meeting? What's the content of your kind of um, training uh, mentor mentorship plan? Um, and also that this is extending beyond what's currently available to you. So they don't really want to fund you to do what you already would be doing. This, this needs to be something that's kind of a bit of an expansion and that you're learning something different than you would be able to if you did not have this award. Um, we've talked about the fact that you, know, you want to make the case that this is integrated um, with your research plan, um, but ultimately the goal is to kind of get you on the other side of it, better prepared for the next stage in your career. Um, and the training can be, you know, it doesn't have to be formal training in every area. So it doesn't have to be coursework um, over and over and over and over again. You can do directed readings um, or attending lab meetings where you're going to discuss certain topics on a semi-regular basis or, or it can be coursework um, uh, and it can be participating in um, supervised research experience. So it, you really, it, it's, um, it's a training plan, but it can it's super individualized and it can it can be kind of anything that makes the most sense for you. Um, it can be, you know, attending a workshop um, with, you know, an eye tracking company or something like that where they teach you how to use the, the eye trackers that that can count as part of your training plan. It doesn't just have to be formal coursework. Um, we talked briefly about the institutional environment and commitment to training already. Um, again, this is going to be more kind of describing your program and um, maybe kind of your, your colleagues in the program, the kinds of training opportunities offered within the program and within the department, um, and that, that for an F award, you know, that they're committed to your training and completion of the program and so on. Um, and then in terms of the training and responsible conduct of research, um, this, you know, some institutions have, most institutions have speci a specific course on this that you can enroll in. I always recommend that if that's available at your institution. Um, that their, their NIH has specific requirements about the number of hours and topic areas that you must receive training in, in this realm. So um, you're going to want to describe how you're going to meet all of those criteria. So you'll want to look at the NIH website and exactly what they they specify, but um, you're going to want to describe what's the format going to be, what are the topics that will be covered. They want to see that your mentor will be kind of involved in that process. Um, how long is this going to last? Are you just going to do, you know, a two-day workshop or, or is this kind of be going to be um, sprinkled throughout your, your training um, and how often? Um, and then these are just a few other sections that may or may not, uh, some of them may or may not apply. Um, so the first two um, would only apply for certain applications. I've um, never done anything with those, so I don't have much to say about them, but uh, I'm sure you could read about them on the website. Um, and then resource sharing plans can cover a variety of different things, but um, things like um, submitting the data to, like NIMH has a, a repository basically for, for data from projects they've supported. Um, or sharing with um, colleagues, like how you would share uh, uh, your, your um, what, what you've collected. Um, and then also things like disseminating to the scientific community, to the community in general, and so on. Um, you obviously will have to put together a budget, um, and they are going to look at whether they think what you're proposing is feasible given the budget. There are, of course, limits. Um, for every mechanism that you will want to look at. So that's, that's it for the review process. Actually, do we want to take a quick moment to see if there are any questions about the review process before we move into the next section? Um, so I got a question from Francesca Casing. She asked, how many of your mentors or sponsors should be at your institution for a K award? Great, that's a great question. So I'll give my um, impressions and then feel free, Stephen, to, to share yours. So um, for, for me, uh, from my perspective, I think certainly your primary mentor, um, it's helpful for them to be on, on site um, uh, and your secondary. Um, not everybody has a secondary mentor, but that worked well for me. Um, I can see a case to be made for a primary on your site and a secondary 
secondary. Um, but your, your primary for sure. So at least one, I guess I would say. And then I think a combination of other options uh, works well. And the other thing is they don't have to be people in your department um, necessarily either. So you can find mentorship outside of your department as well. Um, and then a follow-up to that, she also asked, um, uh, is there a way to have a, the primary mentor be at another institution during the R99 phase? Uh, during the R00, yes. Um, in fact, there is no mentor during that phase. So that's the phase where you're like flying on your own. Um, of course, informally, there are hopefully still mentors for you. Um, certainly for me, I've maintained that relationship with my K99 mentor. Um, so once you've be moved into the R00 phase, uh, you don't have to worry about that mentorship. It's a very strange application when you're putting it together because you have to put together the training piece and the research piece for the K99, um, which, um, but then you also have to propose to some degree the R00 research plan as well in the same application before you know where you're going to be. So um, when you make the transition, you kind of can revise that R00 once you know what institution you're going to be at um, and NIH is really flexible about that um, but but you don't need to worry about mentorship at, at that at that point um, and then I see the other question about uh, in the chat how important it is for mentors to have NIH funding and whether it's okay if they have other sorts of funding for F32s and I think it is okay if they have other sorts of funding um, I, I um, you know some mentors may do a lot of work with NSF funding for example but they may have a student who wants to apply for an F32, and I don't, um, I don't see any problem with that. Stephen, do you have any comments? I guess I would say that I do think I have seen reviews where that has been brought up in terms of if the primary mentor. So when I wrote my F31, we did some strategic talking about who was going to be kind of the primary mentor versus co-sponsor, or what roles people had in some part based on prior track record of funding. And um, I, I agree with Megan. I think other funding, especially if it's at the federal level. I think would be viewed um, pretty positively. Um, I would worry a little bit more. I think there might be more concerns among some reviewers or some panels if the mentor is limited in terms of more like foundation funding or internal awards at the institution and things like that. That's great, great point. There's another question. Um, can K or F grants be transferred from one institution to another? Yes, they can be. So the grant does go to the institution um, as grants do. Um, so the, the award actually goes to the institution. Um, so there is variability in how much institutions may or may not be okay with someone taking a K award with them, for example. We've certainly had that here at my institution. I know of other examples where people have had a K. They're, they're, they are started off, but then they go to a different position and they've taken their K with them. I've seen that happen multiple times. The indirects, which are how much, um, how much money the institution gets to cover kind of overhead and other space and other things like that are actually quite, quite small for like a K award compared to an R level award. And so the institution doesn't have as much, they're not losing as much indirects um, for a K award as they would for like an R01, for example. So I know that we just have about 10 minutes left. So just very brief, I'm gonna jump into some tips. Um, I would say start early. You're gonna to wanna to revise that AIMS page over and over and over again, as well as other sections. So really thinking about the timeline to prepare an application, you've seen that there's so many different little components um, to tackle. And so thinking about like the big pieces, like the Canvas stuff and the science, but also the small little pieces and trying to work on those kind of in parallel. But at the end, you're not realizing, oh, there's 20 other little documents I need to do, and this has to be to my grant office in a week. I always think the more that you can, I still do this, the more that you can get examples of funded applications, I think the better just to see different ways that people structure or different figures that people use or how, what, how they might use bold or underlining or italics or what you like and what works for your style. And I do think celebrating success all the way along the path. So submission of an F or K work itself, even before it's gotten to the review stage, is something to celebrate. Um, and you should celebrate those pieces as you go. Um, so in terms of example funded applications, I did do a little searching and saw that this isn't um, an institute, you can see this is National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, not one that I'm planning to submit to anytime soon, but they did post three complete um, sample applications, um, F31 applications, as well as I think the reviewer comments, um, that you can get a good sense of what that summary statement of reviewer comments looks like, as well as the applications themselves. 
the more that you can find ones that are closer to your field, certainly that would be helpful too. I also did just want to give a plug that I have found personally that academic Twitter can be a very, it's a very lively, uh, for, sometimes for better or for worse, it's a very lively uh, community, but I've also found it to be a good resource for being linked to um, different investigators whose work I want to follow or different papers that I have found um, or things like that. But there's also, let's give two examples here. So this was just in the last week where um, uh, uh, Kelly O'Connor graciously has an F31 from NICHD, Child Health Development, so very related to our field, funded on the first semester submission. She gave permission for me to share this and that you can contact her if you would like her full application as an example. Um, and then uh, Margaret Crane um, did the same as well. But she's posted her specific aims as well as her timeline and checklist that she used to open science framework. And so I really do think that the science community um, is pretty active on Twitter. And so that could be one way to find an application or to connect with other researchers. Um, in, that, in that way. Um, Dr. Becker, and I then, have another question, if you don't sure. mind real quick. Um, what do you recommend doing with the rejected application? How do you decide if you should resubmit or not? And if you don't slash can't resubmit, are there ways to reuse the writing you did for the application materials? Um, yes and yes, I would say. So I would say really, Take, take a couple of days off from the reviews um, and then read them and see what is, what's, I mean, at the end of the day, I really do trust the review process and that they're trying to help you become a better scientist. Um, and so how do you take those reviews? Like what is, what could you feasibly do based on both timeline as well as what the project entails? And does a resubmission make sense? Um, and I really do think the more that you can repackage things into a, another product, um, whether that be like a review paper or things like that. I had a it's actually a foundation. I submitted something to the Klingenstein Third Generation Foundation that was not funded. I turned it around, submitted it as an R3 that was funded on its submission. And so I think I think we all do that. The more that you, you can do that or think creatively about, hey, would a foundation be interested in this if I can't resubmit to NIH? Um, absolutely. And so just briefly about T32s, these are training grants that go to the institutions as opposed to an individual investigator. They're at both the pre-doctoral level as well as the postdoctoral level. Um, and you can see that we have a few shameless plugs about ones that we're connected to in some way, shape, or form at our institutions. But there's many of these out there. You can also find them on NIH's um, website. You can search for funded awards um, as well. Well, it looks like we are at time, but but I know Stephen had the our emails on the slide earlier, and, and those slides um, should be available somehow for you at some point. Point. So you can feel free to reach out to us um, if you have questions in the future moving forward. I think we're both open to that. Absolutely. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank you all.